Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, I'm Fred Kemp. I'm President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Uh, and I'm delighted to uh, welcome you to today's conference, Stronger with Allies, uh, the Future of Europe After Brexit. Uh, we, we released our Global Risk 2035 report last week, um, written by Matt Burroughs, formerly of the National Intelligence Council. Uh, I think it's worth reading, but I think its main three points of, of what's changed in the last four years when Matt wrote the last of these, Global Trends 2030, for the intelligence community, not for the Atlantic Council, the three things have changed give us a little bit of context for uh, today's meetings. Um, one, uh, the return of the possibility of major power conflict, which was unthinkable up until just a couple of years ago. Not that it's likely, but it's again something that one has to put on the radar, according to this report. The second is the fraying of Western democracies and societies. And we see it in different forms um, across many of our countries. And then the third is the uh, potential breakdown of the global system. All three of those sort of lie underneath many of the topics we'll be talking about today. We've gathered here at a moment of historic transition for the European Union and the continent as a whole. The vote of the British people to leave the European Union produced uh, a political earthquake, that's easy to say, uh, that will change the face of Europe, but in what way? Will change the UK, but in what way? Um, at the same time, the forces of fragmentation continue to challenge Europe at a moment of historic weakness caused by economic stagnation, <coughs> external and internal security threats, migrant and refugee flows, and sharp political divisions both within and among countries, what we refer to here as the threat within. Against this backdrop, today's conference will seek to promote the leadership and strategies required to tackle the unprecedented challenges facing the transatlantic community. Our colleagues, uh, the German Marshall Fund, uh, have been convening their annual get-together in Brussels uh, this week. And John Kerry spoke to it, uh, making a pitch to rescue the EU-US trade pact, an impassioned reaffirmation of NATO's common defense doctrine, a pep talk on how to combat nationalism and xenophobia, and he extolled the merits of Euro-Atlantic alliance, declaring the need for our unity is as great as ever. And we believe that as well. So with the wide-ranging expertise that our distinguished speakers will offer on key themes such as migration, populism, identity, growth, prosperity, security, and more, this event intends to help inform an ambitious strategy and optimistic vision for Europe after the Brexit vote. Uh, I think we really don't have any other option but to see what kind of lemonade we can make out of these lemons. Today's gathering is part of a broader Atlantic Council campaign that seeks to reinforce the importance of the transatlantic partnership and make the case for US strategic engagement in and with Europe. We believe that the United States is indeed stronger with allies and that Europe is the United States' most important strategic asset and indispensable partner. Uh, this event is organized in cooperation with Slovakia's presidency of the Council of the European Union and I particularly uh, want to thank the ambassador. Where are you, Mr. Ambassador? There you are. Uh, the ambassador, uh, uh, Peter Kemitz, uh, uh, and, um, and his team at the Slovak Embassy, one of the finest members of our diplomatic corps here, and we just so much enjoy working with you and your team. Um, our thanks also go to Ambassador David O'Sullivan and the EU delegation to the US for their valuable role in so much of what we do, but also today, of course. And last but not least, we are delighted to welcome back to the Atlantic Council, Atlantic Council His, Excellency, His Excellency Miroslav Lajcik, Minister of uh, Foreign and European Affairs of Slovakia. We were just talking outside, uh, and I said, it is a shame uh, that you came in second in the polling to be United Nations Secretary General, but number one, you should be enormously proud uh, of uh, 
what that says about your own leadership, what that says about your, your country's reputation in the world today. Uh, and we're, frankly, just a little bit relieved because I think Europe can really use your leadership right now. Uh, Minister Lajcik has dedicated his career to constructive dialogue, inclusive leadership, and active diplomacy in European and international affairs. We thank you for your fantastic cooperation, your leadership at one of the most turbulent times of EU history. In March, you were reappointed Minister of Foreign and European Affairs, holding the portfolio for the third time. From 2012-2016, Mr. Lajcik also uh, served as Deputy Prime Minister of Slovakia. He brings a wealth of experience and knowledge and, uh, of the inner workings of the key institutions, having served in many posts, addressing the challenges and identifying opportunities through our multilateral frameworks. Just to name a couple, uh, Mr. Lajcik served as the Managing Director for Europe and Central Asia of the European External Action Service High Representative and EU Special Representative for Bosnia and Herzegovina, Sarajevo, and many others. He's also one of the most effective diplomats of Slovakia. His service dates to 1994 when he was, a, when he was appointed ambassador to Japan, becoming the youngest ever top diplomat in Slovakia and the youngest foreign ambassador in Japan. Um, we are most grateful that you could join us for this conversation. Uh, the, and we hope to advance strategic games coming off the Bratislava summit and in the final months of your EU presidency. Before I hand the floor to the minister for his welcome, let me point out that this conference is on the record and you can join the conversation on Twitter with hashtag stronger with allies. You're going to see a lot of that hashtag at the Atlantic Council in the coming weeks. The other uh, and, and at AC at uh, the, the, uh, the Twitter handle is at AC Future Europe. After the minister's remarks, Damon Wilson, our executive vice president of the Atlantic Council, will take to the stage to open uh, the first session. Mr. Minister, over to you. Good morning, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, friends. Uh, thank you, Fred, for your kind introduction. It's always a pleasure to be back at the Atlantic Council, and I thank you all for coming uh, to this conference. It's always useful to speak about transatlantic relations, but it's probably more important to do so now than ever. Many major events have taken place in Europe over the last month, and not necessarily positive ones, but uh, one way or another, they will affect our partnership, and it's good that we will have the chance to talk about them this morning and uh, throughout the day. And of course, the venue could not have been chosen more appropriately, and I want to use this opportunity to thank the Atlantic Council for paying constant attention to, to this special bond. And uh, I really hope that uh, we will be able to produce an interesting conclusion that will help us to, to steer our steps uh, in coming weeks and months. I would like to use this opportunity to <coughs> mention three points. My first point is that Europe is determined to continue together in 27. Many predicted a perfect storm for the European Union in the summer of 2016, that migration, Brexit, fiscal problem could break it. Times are obviously not easy, but Europe must and will find strength to overcome these challenges. And we fully understand how serious the situation is and how important it is to offer the right solutions. Our main focus now is in bringing the European Union closer to Europeans. We need to restore confidence and show that the Union works and makes the lives of ordinary people safer and better. Three weeks ago, at an informal EU summit in Bratislava, a strategic reflection on the future of Europe was launched. In Bratislava, the European Union leaders sent a strong message of unity while primarily tackling security, migration, economy, and communication. The roadmap adopted in Bratislava provides us with guidance towards a Europe that is strong, stable, and competitive. Europe has made another step towards finding a solution to the migration crisis, which balances its humanitarian and security dimension. We invest more into prevention and tackling the road causes. 
At the same time, we strive to alleviate the situation of refugees along the migration routes. Thus, we are slowly getting closer to a joint European compromise acceptable for all. Furthermore, we are making, making strides to increase internal security, driven, of course, by terrorist attacks in Belgium, France, Germany, and elsewhere. People rightly expect answers from their governments. And this has created a new momentum for enhancing cooperation among European intelligence structures, but also for a more efficient control over our external borders. European Union countries are beginning to invest more into their military or civilian military capacities. Average European defense spending has begun to rise. Half the lead nations in the reinforcement of the Baltics are Europeans. We stand by your side in Afghanistan. We have agreed in Bratislava to further tighten defense cooperation in a way, and I want to stress that, that is compatible with NATO. Because the reality is that when Brexit is finished, 80% of defense spending in NATO will come from non-EU allies. And we are aware of that. I understand that there is some concern in this city about the notion of European army. Let me assure you that the European Union focus is on projects that improve our capabilities. The Bratislava Declaration is very clear on this point. If we succeed, the Europeans will be in a position to take on a greater share of the defense burden. And I suspect no one in this room would object. This brings me to the newly adopted European Union's global strategy. It represents our shared vision how to strengthen EU's role in the world. It is to project the soft power of transformation, which is what the European Union does best. The European Union will be working closely with key partners in our neighborhood to support their stability and resilience. We intend to assist our partners to strengthen the rule of law, support a vibrant civil society, or fight corruption. By investing into their stability, we invest into ourselves. Yet, an overall shift in our mindsets is needed. We should move from tackling unlikely conventional conflicts into identifying what to do with confusing hybrid threats and information warfare. My second point, strength comes from unity. We have long taken for granted that the United States will see the value in its commitment to Europe. We have long considered it guaranteed but we are no longer so sure now. Some see a bit of uncertainty as, as a good thing. The theory is that it will scare the Europeans into investing more into defense at last. I'm not convinced that it will work that way. The Europeans are invest, investing more in defense already. Yet this is mainly because they see new challenges to the south and mostly to the east. And there is a clear correlation between increases in spendings and how far east you live. Concerns about the US commitment may have an opposite effect. First, they could under undermine Europeans' resolve to face common challenges, as some in Europe begin to wonder whether they will have to deal with the challenges without the United States. And the concerns also make it less likely that further European integration will preserve complementarity with NATO. You know that there are different visions on the future of EU defense. Most in Europe want it closely linked to NATO, but not all. So it might be hard to make the case for complementarity if our biggest and stronger ally shows less interest in the alliance. Our unity has brought many positive results. We recognize that it does not come cheap and deeply value the US investment in helping keep Europe stable and secure. And we strongly believe that it is money well spent as the richness of our trading and investment relationships attests. We can now deepen this link further with an agreement on TTIP as a natural extension of our bond in economy. However, negotiations proved to be difficult or probably more difficult than we expected and it's clear that they won't conclude within this administration's term. We have thus not fulfilled our ambitions and should ask ourselves why 
and what went wrong. Yet, by sticking to hard work done so far, negotiations should continue with quality over speed. And in the end, I believe in success and benefits of it for both sides of the Atlantic. My last point is about courage to make Europe whole and free again. Our collective response to the war in Ukraine in 2014, the focus on strengthening our defense and our deterrence, is right, but also incomplete. It is right because NATO is first and foremost an Article 5 alliance. Our strength comes from the credibility of this essential commitment. But I do feel that our focus on the defense of NATO allies must not come at the expense of our partners not for any sentimental reasons, but because it makes a strong security sense. We will not be safe with our neighborhood in trouble. Just look at the impact of the Balkan Wars of the 90s, or the worries that the war in Ukraine raised all along the eastern border. So as we enhance the defense of our homelands, let's also improve the resilience of countries on our borders. We have to take far more interest in their vulnerabilities. These differ, however. Somewhere the challenge is corruption, elsewhere disinformation or economic dependency. We have to use every tool to address those vulnerabilities. In some places that will be advice, elsewhere financial assistance. Where relevant, we should also maintain the prospect of NATO and EU membership. No power has proven more transformative in recent European history than the yearning to join these two great integration projects. A lot of good work has been done and a very difficult decision taken to qualify for membership. Both the European Union and NATO do remain attractive. And this pool is part of our security and our strength. That, that is our leverage to encourage further transformation. And that's why the Slovak EU presidency has enlargement as one of its priorities to keep this agenda alive and credible. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope the European Union will come out of these hard times stronger and better once again, because we do not have any better alternative. And whatever happens across the Atlantic, I'm sure the Atlantic Council will be all over it. This conference is rightly not only about the transatlantic li link. Its subtitle alludes to a European dimension, which is almost visionary. The American public deserves to know what exactly happens in Europe and what future holds for us all, because it is essential to preserve this, that unique link also for the future generations. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Lychuk. Good morning, everyone. I'm Damon Wilson, Executive Vice uh, President for Programs and Strategy here at the Atlantic Council. I want to thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you, Fred, for kicking off today's conference. And I think underlining the importance of this conversation on Europe's future at a time when the transatlantic community faces historic uncertainty. But as Fred and as the Minister alluded, this isn't just a conversation. This is a bit of a campaign about around ideas, both ideas and ideals at the Atlantic Council about how do we actually define, salvage, and defend what we care about, this community of interest and this community of values. So think of what we're doing today as not just a conversation, but how you can help contribute to this campaign in the weeks and months ahead. We've got a terrific lineup. We'll be focused today on some of the political trends driving what's happening in Europe coming up next followed by some of the economic prosperity issues that are really underlying uh, this issue. And then we'll close with some political leaders and strategists to think about what we do about this in terms of the way forward on strategy. Um, but we wanna begin by understanding what's happening. We've seen a sharp rise in populist movements, obviously on both sides of the, the Atlantic, thrust forward by issues from immigration, austerity, stagnating incomes, to mistrust in facts and institutions. Clearly, the United Kingdom's Brexit vote on June 23rd rattled the foundations of the European project, a union that's protected the European continent and the wider transatlantic community from violence and division for decades, and yet now faces serious questions about its futures. So as part of this work, we're doing our own bit to try to sustain the transatlantic link. I just want to mention here that we announced yesterday 
uh, the welcoming of Ambassador Westmacott, uh, Sir Peter, the former British Ambassador to the United States, uh, former British Ambassador to France, Turkey, uh, expert in Iran, will be joining the Atlantic Council family as a distinguished ambassadorial fellow. We'll hear from the ambassador today. Thank you for being with us, uh, our own contribution to trying to keep the transatlantic link strong. But beyond the, the wake-up call of Brexit, according to our researchers, there are about 45 insurgent or populist parties, depending on how you look at it, now in Europe that are gaining prominence and significance and influence. And clearly, we have a pretty distinct US uh, election season that we're going through, revealing a sense of anti-establishment sentiment and potentially an inward turn, which could hurt our longstanding partnerships. So how do you govern and how do you lead it's our societies in this environment. It's clear now, I think, even more than ever, that elites, that our governments, that we have to pay close attention and understand what's happening. We have to pay attention to public opinion while shaping domestic and foreign policies. But I think what we would argue here is that this political environment is also potentially a window of opportunity. People are engaged. They're speaking out. They're acting out. And while some raising their voices back ideolo ideologies that put our alliances, our transatlantic values, the idea of open economies into question, these individuals Al, are in some respects now more reachable. They've really entered the conversation. So let's join that conversation. It's in this context, it's crucial to hear from experts like our next briefer, Mr. Bruce Stokes, who is the Director of Global Economic Attitudes at the Pew Research Center. And we're doing this to ground our conversations that we're gonna to have today on political, social, economic future of our states and citizens in attitudes. With data, with polling, we can better understand developments, we can strategize effective policies, and think about how you forge inclusive leadership in this context. So this for us is intentional. We've begun our discussions on everything we're doing on these sets of issues by beginning them on understanding what are we hearing from our electorates and what does that mean in terms of what we're, how we're gonna take this forward? It doesn't mean you just follow public opinion. You often have to lead it, but we certainly need to be responsive and understand. Bruce is a longtime friend of the Atlantic Council. He currently serves as the Director of Global Atti Economic Attitudes at the Pew Research Center. He's written and, and spoken uh, widely on European and global trends, helping to equip political business leaders to face pressing issues, make decisions amid complexity. He's had affiliations with the German Marshall Fund, Chatham House, and so I want to turn it over to, to Bruce to ground us as we aim today to transform a constructive dialogue into serious action, galvanizing the leadership and strategies required to secure the future of a strong, stable, and competitive Europe that's allied to a purposefully and globally engaged, engaged United States. Bruce, over to you. Damon, thank you very much, and uh, Mr. Minister, uh, thank you for your, your uh, kind leadership of, of uh, the transatlantic community, uh, and your words were inspiring to all of us, I think, and Fred has left, but I'd like to thank Fred for being an old friend and, and leading, I think, the Atlantic Council into a new era, which has uh, really made it a major player on transatlantic uh, relations. As, as Damon said, um, we thought it would be appropriate to share with you some of the public opinion data we have taken this year in Europe uh, that touches on some of the populist issues that are driving the political debates around Brexit, but also uh, the political debates in France and Germany and other uh, European countries to try to better understand what's animating this discussion. Um, because I think for far too long, those of us who are members of the elite and have followed transatlantic relations maybe throughout our entire career have uh, felt that we knew best what was what was worked for the Atlantic uh, Alliance um, and are having uh, to uh, understand that our populations may not share all those views, may not share all those values, and that uh, their uh, votes at the uh, in the voting booth uh, could upset uh, the grand schemes of transatlantic elites uh, more than we might have expected. So I think it is terribly valuable to try to understand public opinion uh, because uh, uh, moving forward, the publics could, uh, through their votes, uh, set uh, both sides of the Atlantic off in different directions than we've been on for the last generation. And I do think that that um, is something we need to understand. Uh, this. Uh, Survey data was put together by the Pew Research Center. I won't 
belabor that, uh, belabor who we are, but we're based in Washington, been around for about 20 years. We've been, to go, we've been polling in Europe for the last 15 years. And basically, um, all of this material is available on the website, all of it's searchable, and all of it's free. So I commend it to you. And uh, the Atlantic Council would be happy to share with you this slide deck uh, if you ask. Uh, it's certainly um, uh, available. This survey was done in April and May of this year uh, in 10 European countries, uh, mostly phone interviews, but uh, some face to face. Uh, Clearly, it's the economy, stupid, as James Carville said. Uh, publics are upset about the economy, but they're also up upset about uh, the role Brussels is playing. As you can see, uh, some uh, European publics uh, see the economy improving, but for the most part, uh, uh, people are still very disgruntled about the uh, state of the economy. Uh, only in Germany, really, uh, do you have uh, a strong uh, support for the state of the economy. Even that's down a little bit. Um, uh, I would, I would uh, share with you that uh, only 29% of Americans think the economy is doing well in the United States. So this is, this is a transatlantic phenomenon. Uh, not surprisingly, or maybe, maybe surprisingly to you, people on the right uh, are much more concerned about the economy in some key countries, such as Hungary and Poland, where we have the emergence of, of right-wing populist movements. Uh, uh, in the UK, people uh, uh, who support UKIP are uh, far more uh, concerned about the economy than people on the left. Uh, we have seen a decline in support for the EU, uh, which is, comes as no surprise to many of you, I'm sure. In the wake of the uh, financial crisis, there was a dramatic drop-off in support for the EU. Uh, we began to see in 2014 and 2015 a rebound in support for the EU, which has now dropped off again. Uh, can't fully explain that, uh, except we do have some questions I think to get at that. But uh, uh, the, um, uh, the faith in the EU is headed, was headed, this spring was headed down again. Uh, <laughs> We think part of this is continued disappointment with the EU's handling of the economy. As you can see, uh, in most countries, uh, a majority disapprove of how Brussels is handling the economy. Uh, in every country, at least six in 10 people disapprove of the way the EU is handling the refugee crisis. So that's probably an even stronger driver of this new decline in support for the EU. Um, in the, in the run-up to Brexit, we decided not to ask people in Britain how they were going to vote, but we decided to ask people all over Europe in 10 European countries, do you want more power to come back to your national capital as the British are about to vote to bring more power back to their national capital? And what you find is that four in 10 Europeans say they want more power brought back to their uh, national capital. So there is a base on the continent, not just in, in Britain, for uh, some kind of devolution of power back to uh, national capitals. Um, we, you may not be surprised, mostly this is people on the right who want this. What's interesting is it's people on the left in Sweden, the blue, who want more power to come back to Stockholm. And probably not surprisingly, it's people uh, on the left in Greece and Spain who uh, want more power back from the EU. So we should remind our, I think this reminds ourselves that the populist anti centralist uh, sentiment in Europe is primarily a right-wing phenomenon in Europe, but it's not exclusively a right-wing phenomenon in Europe. Um, we ask people, uh, uh, do you think Brexit will be good or bad for the EU? Overwhelmingly people, this was before the vote, by the way, and overwhelmingly people said, yes, it's going to be bad for the EU. Be interesting to see, to ask this question now, whether they think it still is a bad thing for the EU or not. Uh, we, uh, you, you, never, you know, the timing of these things determines some of the outcome. Um, obviously, a second issue is the handling of refugees and the broader issue of integration of Muslims into European society as Europe becomes more diverse. Uh, we ask people whether diversity made this, our country a better place to live, a worse place to live, or it really didn't matter. What is interesting here is that Basically, about a third of Europeans say uh, uh, diversity makes our country a worse place to live. 
I can tell you the comparison in the U.S. is 8% who say that diversity is a worse. We have drunk the Kool-Aid. We have accepted the fact that diversity is good for us. doesn't mean we necessarily love immigrants, but in principle, we have uh, accepted this as a, uh, a benefit to our, our um, uh, country far more than many Europeans. Uh, notice in Greece and Italy, it's a majority of the public say diversity is bad for the country. Uh, it's people on the right who are much more likely to say that diversity is bad than people on the left, and that's in most of the countries we surveyed. And those differences, by the way, are statistically significant. They're double-digit differences. Um, we ask people periodically in Europe, how do you feel about Muslims? How do you feel about Roma? How do you feel about Jews? Uh, the um, antipathy towards Muslims is quite high in places like France, uh, Italy. Uh, hasn't changed that much, uh, which is interesting. I can tell you what is, to my mind, most interesting. People have even greater antipathy towards Roma in, uh, in Europe. And, of course, the Roma have been in Europe for, forever. So it's, it's, an interesting, it's, a, it's an interesting sequestrant of uneasiness with the other. Um, it's people on the right who have a more negative attitude of Muslims in almost every country we surveyed, and these are huge differences. Um, one of the interesting questions, it seems to me, is why do people have antipathy towards Muslims in most of Europe? And it's basically because uh, 58, a median of 58 percent all over Europe say Muslims don't integrate into the society. They do not want to become part of the society. Is that, I'm not saying that's true. I'm just saying that's what people believe. Um, and it's people on the right, again, who are much more likely to say that Muslims do not want to integrate than people on the left. Um, we ask people about refugees because that's obviously an, an immediate issue. As you can see, um, uh, a median of about 40, 40, was it 49 percent, 45 percent say that refugees are a threat to the country. Uh, notice that Poland is the country that thinks, sees refugees as the greatest threat. As the DCM at the Polish embassy here said to me, I don't know if he's, in he's here or not, but this was earlier this year, he said, we haven't taken many of them. <laughs> and you know, the, it's what we find in the United States. The counties that have the lowest immigrant population are the counties with the highest anti-immigrant sentiment. So it is fear of the other, uh, I think, is what we're picking up here. Um, why do people uh, fear refugees? Uh, the uh, strongest concern is a fear about terrorism. But uh, trailing that is uh, fear about uh, what the impact of refugees on the economy and government services. Uh, crime is really not, despite what happened in Cologne last uh, New Year's Day, it is not a, a major concern of publics when you ask them. Um, this year, for the first time, we decided to ask people in European countries questions that have been asked of Americans uh, for a number of years, uh, questions to try to get at a sense of nativism. In other words, what does it mean to be a true German? What does it mean to be a true Pole? To, again, to try to get at this sense of identity and are people feeling threatened, uh, are there, they feel that their identity is threatened in this modern era. Uh, the median across Europe in the 10 countries we surveyed, basically 77% of people say you have to be able to speak the language to be a true German or to be a true Italian or be a true Frenchman. Um, I would suggest to you this, this is one of the limitations of survey research. What did the respondent hear? You could conceivably have said, to function in this society, you have to speak the language. That may be what respondents heard. And ask yourself that question. Do you think you have to speak English to function well in the, in, in the United States? I can tell you Americans believe that. Americans believe you have to speak English to be a true American. Um, share the national customs and traditions. Uh, as you can see, a, uh, a plurality of people say you have to share our customs and traditions to be uh, a true German or a true Pole. Again, we don't know what the respondent was thinking when they heard the word traditions and customs. Does it mean you have to wear a dirndl? Or does it mean that we don't beat our wives, even though you beat your wife in, in a foreign culture? So again, think about how you'd answer this question. I can tell you Americans answer this question about the way the Europeans answer this question. We believe that you have to follow American traditions and customs to be a true American. You have to be born in this country. 33% um, uh, of uh, Europeans say you need to be born in this country. 
uh, that it's very important, but notice it's a majority who say it's very important or somewhat important. The interesting one to me is um, only 15% of, of, of Europeans say you have to be Christian to be a European. I can tell you it's twice that number in the United States. Uh, half of Americans say you have to be, it's very important or somewhat important to be Christian to be uh, uh, a true American. As someone who's married to a Jew, I must say, I find this a bit offensive. But it is, but that in the United States, we've asked this question, we and other people have asked this question four times, and it hasn't changed that much. So uh, we are, I would say we are equally nativist with the Europeans, although on the question of religion, we are even more nativist than uh, most Europeans. Just to go briefly, as you can see, language is overwhelmingly something people believe. It's people on the right who are more likely to say you have to speak the local language to be a true native of our country. Uh, again, people tend to believe you have to follow our customs and traditions. Notice the Germans and the Swedes are the least likely to uh, say that. Uh, again, it's people on the right who believe that. Uh, do you have to be born in our, in our country to be a true uh, uh, German or, or Swede? Again, the Germans and the Swedes are the least likely to say that's very important, um, and even the least likely to say that it's very or somewhat important, whereas the Hungarians and the Greeks overwhelmingly say it's very uh, important. Uh, do you have to be Christian? Again, it's the Greeks and the Poles who say you have to be Christian to be um, uh, considered a true Greek or a true Pole. And we did a little index to see who we thought, comparing all four of these questions, which are the most nativist cultures in Europe. As you can see, it's Hungary, Greece, Poland. Uh, and I would submit to you, these are where you have some of the most populist uh, uh, movements uh, on the left in Greece, on the right in Hungary and Poland. So these things tend to come together. Um, a final advertisement, we will in mid-November uh, be releasing a survey where we look at what it is overall what people who favor right-wing populist parties believe in Europe and hopefully we'll be able to say how much of what they believe is shared by people in centrist parties and left-wing parties to try to get a sense of what is the potential size of the vote of right-wing populist parties in Europe. But stay tuned on that. Thank you. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bruce. Now that we've somehow probably offended almost every uh, nationality in some yeah. capacity yeah. in this conversation, um, to keep us on track, I just want to try see if I can take one comment, one question uh, for Bruce on these slides, and then they will be available uh, from our, our team, and Bruce will be available uh, to speak to you as well, of course, uh, throughout the course of the day. So let me take a question from this gentleman here, and then we'll move into our next conversation, please. Yeah, Chris Bledowski from Manufacturers Alliance for Productivity Innovation. I'll put away my hat as an economist and, and a transatlanticist and put my hat as a Pole, being born in Poland. So I take all your comments on Poland uh, straight in. Uh, but at the same time, one of your first slides showed that Poles are the most Euro-enthusiastic. How do you square the Euro-enthusiasm of Poles with being Poles being the most nativist? Uh, you would probably better place it, Chris, to answer that question than I would. I think it's because uh, the um, being a member of the European Union has been very, very good for the Polish economy. Uh, until recently, you know, Poland has was one of the strongest uh, economic growth records in in, in Europe and. Um, what's interesting, I can tell you about uh, our analysis to date of uh, the views by political party in, in Poland is you don't get much differentiation between supporters of the current government, which is arguably more populist and maybe right, you could argue more right wing, and, and for supporters of, of the outgoing party, the party that, that was in power. Which means, I think, that this we're reflecting a more of a nativist view of polls in general that has less to do with political leanings and ideology. Um, but why it is that they could be both enthusiastic about the EU and terribly nativist, I, I, I can't answer that question. Bruce, thank you so yeah. much. One of the things I enjoy doing with Pew is that they give you the numbers as they are. They, t they just tell you what the story comes from that. Um, and 
leave it to others to figure out what you do about it. And so I want to make that transition. I want to thank Bruce very much for that presentation, uh, for that data. I encourage you all to follow up on that information and use that to set the scene to move into our conversation. Let me invite Laura Mondeville, who will be moderating this, as well as the, her panelists uh, that will join her in this conversation. Laura will go ahead and introduce uh, the discussion as well as her colleagues on stage. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to start um, this discussion, which is uh, quite a challenging, I think, uh, and a very important one. The title of this panel, and I think the conference, is Populist Rebellion, right? And um, so this is really, I mean, what has been said before is that we are dealing with an extraordinary um, deep crisis, identity crisis. Uh, in, in Europe and which has been deepened by the 2015-2016 migration crisis uh, triggering this extraordinary rise as Damon mentioned of uh, anti-establishment parties and movements and quite a, you know, a, a lot of uh, electoral victories for some of these parties throughout Europe. We're seeing at the same time this uh, extraordinary parallel uh, rebellion, populist rebellion on the other side of the Atlantic. And um, so the question is, what does that all mean? And um, the, a, a, a friend of mine who is professor of, at Georgetown University, Joshua Mitchell, recently in an article was talking about uh, the mental dust that is upon us. And he was meaning by that, you, you know, quoting Tocqueville, this sort of uh, uncertainty in which the political and intellectual elites are in uh, acknowledging what is happening. We are in disarray, let's be clear. We don't know what is happening to us. We've been, to a certain extent, in denial of what is happening, but now we're hit with such a, a strength that we have no choice but we f to face this crisis and try to find some answers to what is happening. To, to uh, try to answer, uh, this question of what is happening to us. Uh, we have this uh, very good panel here, very distinguished, and uh, if I can uh, start from my uh, immediate left, uh, Paula Dobriansky, uh, very nice to meet you, uh, Paula, and uh, you, 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 here you, you're very well known, I understand, you've been under secretary of, uh, of state in the Bush administration, and you have uh, worked in many positions in government, and you are now at Harvard University. Uh, working on European issues uh, at the Kennedy School of Government. So um, then we have uh, Ambassador Kassir, uh, very nice to meet you, Ambassador. Uh, you are, you are uh, currently uh, Ambassador to the Hungary uh, for Slovakia, and uh, you've been here also as Ambassador to the US, and you are uh, very deep, uh, you have deep knowledge of European and transatlantic issues, and I think you have uh, attended uh, in many ways to the integration of Slovakia into uh, the, the NATO uh, alliance and the EU. Yes, I can be blamed for that. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Benjamin, my friend Benjamin Haddad, who is a French uh, uh, scholar at the Hudson Institute and uh, has been actually pretty involved in uh, international affairs in, the polit in politics in France and moved now to being a a very uh, you know, fine observer of what is happening both in Europe and in the US and comparing the two at Hudson Institute. And then we have Ashley, um, Ashley, I'm sorry, I <laughs> forgot your name, uh, Ashley. Uh, <laughs> Ashley Godwin. I'm sorry, Ashley That's Godwin. Okay. Yes, you are actually, you're coming straight from Britain, which is uh, very important where, where the Brexit just occurred and you're a committee specialist working on uh, the Committee on Foreign Affairs and uh, National Security uh, at the House of Commons. Yeah. So welcome to us, uh, to you all. And uh, I'm actually st st going to start from uh, Ashley and ask her, uh, Ashley, uh, since you're coming from Great Britain and, and, and we, we've had this earth political earthquake just for the, uh, I mean, as, as well for, uh, for Britain as for the EU, uh, what do you make of what happened? What is happening? What is the nature of this re rebellion? Um, well, can I just start by saying it's an absolute pleasure to be here at the Atlantic Council. I'm also an Atlantic Council Millennium Fellow, which is the capacity I'm here in today. 
One of the unexpected personal outcomes of Brexit is that I almost always get asked to speak first ever since. Um, I mean, that is the multi-million dollar question, isn't it? What, what is happening um, in the UK? I would say it's not just the UK, it's happening and we've already seen the really, really interesting data. I definitely want a copy of those slides. Um, it's a global problem. If you look at you know, sort of the migration figures, I think the UNHCR last year estimated 65 million people displaced by conflict. To put that into context, that's the size of the population of the UK, either internally or externally displaced. But as the Euro European migration crisis shows, it's not just about conflict, it's also about people seeking economic security as well. So I think we're seeing many different um, elements coming together. And, and part of this is the impact of globalization. It's so much easier for people to move now. People have access to more information. Um, you have free movement, free flows. Um, and in some ways, this has brought prosperity for quite a few people. But actually, on the other side, as the data has shown, um, it's actually also been a very uneven, unequal process. And I think our politicians have really struggled to get to grips with actually just how bad, how adverse some of those effects have been for people within their country. And I think if you look at the Brexit vote, and I, I would add a disclaimer here, the problem with in-out, yes-no referenda is you get a single answer but it, it hides an absolute multitude of motivations. So you can't say the people in the UK voted, 70 million people voted to leave the EU because they dislike Brussels. You can't say they wanted their sovereignty back. You can't say they dislike migrants. There are so many people who had their own personal motivations. But one thing you can look at is, especially since the financial crisis, the uneven nature of the economic recovery. The, the UK economy as a whole is now growing very slowly but it is growing, but not in certain parts of the country. And I think if you look at the um, dire predictions for the UK economy made by politicians, it was known as Project Fear in the UK. Um, the Chancellor George Os Osborne was saying, you know, you're basically voting for a self-inflicted recession. You're voting to put a bomb under the economy. And yet people still voted for it. And I think that really does speak volumes about how badly people felt about their own situation as it was before the vote, that they really didn't care that they were voting for this economic disaster, which has yet to happen because we haven't actually left yet. In fact, we haven't even notified anyone that we're going to leave. Um, but still, c c shouldn't we, though, you know, uh, really try to name the main uh, trigger uh, elements of this rebellion? And shouldn't we uh, sort of sum up and say that basically this is a rebellion against as you said, globalization, also open-ended immigration, and, and uh, also a rebellion against supranational structures that, which are perceived as not protective. And isn't it actually, uh, most of all, this rebellion, a, a need for protection, a rebellion of the unprotected, mm. the people who are not benefiting, uh, you know, unlike the elite, from the uh, sort of uh, good uh, sides of, uh, of globalization and, and, and flows of people. Yeah, absolutely. So I think what you're seeing now is sort of a, a switch from, well, it's still there, but a sort of move away from the conventional, the traditional politics, if you like, of left versus right. And now you're starting to see a move, or at least an intersection towards open versus closed. People who feel that uh, globalization works for them and people who feel that it doesn't, that actually they've lost out. They feel insecure precisely because they have these different factors that are happening to them. Their own governments are not necessarily listening. And at the same time, you might have had um, some elements of sovereignty move towards, in the case of the UK, a lot of people feel, feel that the, the bureaucrats in Brussels, the politicians in Brussels, are faceless. They're unaccountable. They're not engaged with British politics and British way of life. And I think all of those factors come together in this. And if you look at... Um, our, our new Prime Minister, Theresa May, who became Prime Minister in July, she um, gave what I believe is quite a telling speech yesterday at the end of the Conservative Party conference, and I would urge everyone in this room to go and read it, because um, if you look at her speech, she is precisely, this is what she's trying to address. This feeling in the UK, and the main mantra she's come out with since July is she wants to create a country 
that works for everyone, not just the privileged few. And I don't believe that that phrase, not just the privileged few, is her trying to shed the image of the Tory party as being for the wealthy. I think she's trying to get at this sense that actually the economy, politics, hasn't really been working for a lot of people in the country, regardless of whether you're Tory, Labour, Lib Dem, whatever your political affiliation. Um, and if you look at her speech yesterday, there are a few main themes. One, um, economic fairness, social justice, equality of opportunity, and then my favorite one, uh, meritocratic Britain. Meritocratic Britain is now a proper noun. If you read her speech, it's capitalized and everything. But I think it really shows those themes are something that she wants her government to address. Um, whether she'll be able to, given that the focus that will be required to actually negotiate Brexit is another question. But I think it's really very telling that those are the things she's called out and has been the main point of discussion at the Conservative, the leading party conference this week. Uh, Benjamin, uh, <coughs> if we can move to France, which is also actually uh, uh, you know, crossed by a, a huge uh, doubt, identity doubt, uh, huge uh, crisis of identity which has been triggered or reinforced by the uh, terrorist attacks, which have been very many uh, in the recent uh, months. Uh, how do you see this, uh, this question in France, uh, uh, France, which used to be actually the, uh, you know, the sort of uh, engine of Europe and, and the, the country believing in the European project, and now we see in the data we, we, we've uh, been presented with that France has so many doubts you know, about, about the European Union. What is it, and uh, is there this, uh, uh, this doubt that multiculturalism is not working? Um, yeah, I think very much so. W one of the things that I find most striking is, uh, you know, I'm a French <laughs> citizen, I've lived here for two years now, is the similarities between the debate in the United States and in Europe. And I'm pretty sure it's, it's never been so close since maybe the Second World War. Um, you, you know, both continents are in periods of transition, economic, social, cultural, and in both cases, you see a, a growing demand for, as you said, protection. Economic protection, but not only economic protection, also a form of social and cultural protection. There is a demand among a certain uh, part of voters for a form of cultural cohesion, social cohesion, and, and you clearly feel it in, in, in France, and it's true that um, you know, when you hear Theresa May who says, when you're a citizen of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere, and you hear Donald Trump at the Republican convention, uh, you know, saying I'm the America first candidate against the globalist candidate. I mean, you, you see that the debate is, is starting to be structured the same way. It's not about so much about the welfare state or economics or uh, big ideologies like it used to be in the 20th century, but it's really about the relationship to globalization, open societies, uh, the European Union in, in, in Europe and, and the relation to, to borders and, and identity and, and multiculturalism. And it's very interesting that you know, in, in many countries in Europe, uh, you see even the, the political structure, you know, the political parties are st starting to reorganize themselves according to this. Do you in, think in the challenges of Islam is, is a key part of this uh, unease, of this debate? I mean, how, how much is it triggering this conversation according to you? Uh, I, I think the, the issue of identity and the issue of integration of, of Muslim immigrants is clearly a, a key factor. Uh, beyond, by the way, the terrorism aspect, which, yes. which I, I don't even think that's the key issue. There was a, a report that's very interesting uh, from Institut Montaigne, which is sort of a centrist think tank in France, uh, last week that said that if you look at the Muslim population in France, for example, you have a, a majority of them that is uh, becoming more and more secular, more and more integrated, that completely respects French identity or, and and you know, Republican principles, but you do have a sizable minority, something among 28%, uh, according to the report, and that's 50% of the people under 25 who actually uh, uh, put religious identity or Islamic identity above uh, French identity. So that's, that's a challenge, and it's clearly gonna be a key issue uh, in the French presidential election that's coming in the next spring, and, and you can see that you know, people are organizing themselves according to this. It's, it's quite likely that, uh, I mean, at least if the election were held today, Marine Le Pen would be in the second round. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is in front of her, you'll have either the center left or the center right candidate. It could be someone like Juppé or like the uh, economics minister who just resigned, uh, Emmanuel Macron, who will be the sort of pro-European, liberal, social democrat uh, uh, candidate. So, you know, it can be either the center left or center right, but they, there's a, you know, uh, reorganization of politics, I think, 
along, along these lines. And you see this everywhere in Europe. I mean, it's interesting. In, uh, uh, in Italy, Renzi's, uh, Renzi rules from the center and his opposition is both the far left with Beppe Grillo and the, the far right with the Northern League. You have Merkel in Germany who is today more popular among SPD voters than Sigmar Gabriel, who's the leader of the, the SPD. So, you know, you, you have these, these, I think these divisions are, they're shifting. And if I can add, you know, something else, if, if liberals, pro-European liberals want to win this debate, they have to take into consideration these, these fears from we're gonna voters. We're going to go back to that. Absolutely. Okay. This is the second part of, of this uh, uh, debate. But I want to move to Ambassador Garcia and ask you, um, why do you think this uh, rebellion has been so strong in Eastern Europe, um, so stark? I mean, we've seen that the crisis against migrants has uh, triggered a, a, a huge rejection uh, among, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, you know, willingness to, to close the borders, the, the fear to be overwhelmed. And uh, we've seen uh, the emergence of uh, uh, leaders, uh, nationalist, author authoritarian in some parts, uh, willing to uh, question, you know, the uh, legitimacy of Brussels uh, in the country you are serving in, especially now. So it would be interesting to, um, to, to see what you think. Why that? Is it, is it the fear to, to lose uh, the sovereignty that uh, uh, the East Europeans have been longing to regain for s such a long time? Or is it that they're looking at Western Europe and seeing the, uh, you know, challenges, to say the least, of multiculturalism, and they say, no, we don't want that? I mean, how do you see that? Regain sovereignty. <clears throat> I think there is a lot of hypocrisy what is going on, and a lot of uh, reality versus uh, perception in what we are living. Uh, when you would look, there is a good blog, by the way, just for the inspiration. Uh, the title is uh, very nice, and the title is saying, is it just me or is the world going crazy? Uh, Mark Manson wrote it. Uh, and uh, he goes uh, arguing that what is the reality of the world and what is our perceptions? And the truth is that when you would do it, and the polling is good, when you would look at the fears of people and you would look at the realities, in Poland, where is the highest uh, uh, fear of, of threat of terrorism because of migrants, realities, there is almost no migrants. In Slovakia, we've given 15 asylums a year. Uh, so what, you know, 15 migrants can cause, uh, even in the small 5 million country. And the probability that you die of terrorist attack is um, thousand times lower uh, as being killed by a hairdryer if it pops down into your, uh, um, um, w while you take a shower. So, you know, there is also a perception of something that Brussels is an arch enemy. This is a course of, of all evil, what is going on. And we see leaders coming after Brussels meeting and saying, oh, this bloody Brussels immigrant quota decision. Then you look into what they bitch about and you find that they've been voting for it. So prime ministers come to the council, which is not a Brussels, it's the national body based on national decision making. They vote for some decision, they come home and instantly, like in the uh, high level of schizophrenia, they will start to criticize Brussels about the decision. So first of all, we live in the parallel realities and politis politics lost any shame here uh, to work on these parallel realities. We see it in, in US campaign, you know, uh, people prove that uh, Trump would lie in 70% of his statement, but nevertheless, he would get almost 50% support. So they know he's lying, but dis despite that they are inclined to vote for him. And we see the same thing uh, in Europe. You see that these guys are absolutely divert, damaging, sometimes even crazy, but there is some fatal attraction for I'm going to, uh, to, 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 to go for you. And on, the, um, on this fear of, of different, there is something about this, you know. They, uh, I, I really, um, I was struck by the cultural difference here, how Poles and Hungarians, and I think Slovaks would be close to that if they were included, how they fear of different, and how those who were living in the more um, colorful societies, they are more, uh, or they fear much less. In Slovakia, I remember when I was young, which was not that time, not that long time ago, uh, and I want to marry. First question when I came home, I said, I got a girl I'm going to marry. 
my grandma first question was, is she Catholic? <laughs> um, and if I said, if I said she's Lutheran, that would be a problem. Mm -hmm. If I said she's Jewish, or she would say, oh my God, you know, uh, it maybe they would overcome, but that would be the concern. Mm -hmm. If I would marry from one village in Tatras to another one, which by a distance uh, in the air would be 10 kilometers, around the valley you maybe need to go 20. If I marry there, even my kids born there, they would call them the kids of that stranger who married here. So there is something in, in Central Europe. We were living somewhere behind, you know, uh, Count Schwarzenberg called it, the former uh, Czech foreign minister, the valley mentality of Central Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, living a little bit apart, but it, it, this is to me, I still do not understand, because if I look into the old Hungarian kingdom, which were part of uh, many nations for almost 1,000 years, this was based on at least four national pillars of Magyars, um, Slovaks, uh, Jews, and, and Germans. And we managed to live in this colorful society for a long time. And now, like everything, you, like you, you got erased the hard disk in your brain. A Magyar or a Magyar or Hungarian, Hungary to Hungarians, and in Slovakia also. So I think, I think there is something thick, sick which is, which is going on uh, within us, and we can come back to it in, in the next round. Um, I, I'm going to move to you, uh, Paula, um, Ambassador Dobryansky. Uh, uh, if you could give us the view from uh, across the pond and tell us, uh, given the fact that you are too uh, witnessing this incredible uh, rebellion, uh, which has a name now called Donald Trump, uh, uh, how do you see what is going on in Europe? You know. Uh, uh, to a certain extent, maybe I would say, maybe a year ago, I mean, I, I spent eight years in Washington and just left now, and I would have said that maybe a year ago before the Trump phenomenon, the Americans would have probably taken a pretty critical, I would say maybe a bit condescending view on what is happening in Europe and would have said, oh, guys, you, you don't know how to deal with that. You know, we, we've been so good and uh, you, you, know, you don't know how to integrate, uh, uh, look at us and, 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 do, and do the work, right? But now it, it happens that this is a, a, a global Western uh, uh, rebellion. So what do you see from where you are? Well, I think there are a number of factors. And first, let me commend the Atlantic Council for bringing us together and especially this particular panel is an interesting one because it's not one in which we've always had deep dives here. We always look at more the strategic and the economic, but in this particular piece, I think it really adds uh, an important element to the discussion. But what do I think? I think uh, you've heard all of the factors already as to what has contributed to the challenges. But let me step back and focus on a few that maybe haven't been said. I'd start with, I mean, there's you intimated in particular, I'd start with the issue of leadership. And something that comes to my mind, um, looking at where we are and the question about our role in the world, not just only relevant to the transatlantic relationship, um, but uh, uh, looking at also the leaders in Europe. I feel that one thing that has moved aside is what we'd call a moral narrative. Mm -hmm. A moral narrative about the very values that we hold dearly. Yes. I don't think that that has undergirded a lot of what's going on. We look at many of the particulars, and you have to look at the particulars clearly to solve the problems. But in a way, we're being challenged. And I think not just only by, I would say, uh, the neighbor to the east, but even more globally, we're being challenged. And I think there's an important element here where there has to be a political desire of activism, of, as the foreign minister said in his remarks, unity of purpose mm -hmm. and strength in, 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 in you know, that kind of, of numbers, but here, there has to be a, a, I think, which hasn't been, an articulation of, of the very values that, by the way, really united us and brought us forward at a very difficult time. Think about it, post-World War II and even during the heyday of the Cold War. But having said that, let me come to the second. 
because there's a second piece, and that is the issue of our institutions and our alliances. I'm a firm believer in our institutions, and I'm not just speaking of, you know, in this case, narrowly defined European institutions, but more broadly. But you know something, the world has changed. And in that sense, I think where we come up short, we're not being as flexible or as fluid as we can or should be in looking at how do we address these kinds of issues. I mean, let me give another one, if I can, in the mix. The foreign minister, it struck me that in his remarks, he mentioned Ukraine. Right? I spend a lot of time working on Ukraine, but why does it matter? It matters because Europe is seized by this, these migration flows, this question of identity. And to me, as I've said, identity is not just nationalism. It is about our identity of values, which undergird us. And that's key, I think. Mm -hmm. But uh, he mentioned Ukraine. And you know, while there's that migration challenge, the economic challenges, right there in Ukraine, you have uh, 1.5 to 2 million internally displaced persons. Think about that. And think about the ramifications of that relative to stability, to security. We know very well the economic. We know very well the military uh, uh, challenges. Uh, and the uh, invasion uh, of, of Ukraine, but it's not as focused, the humanitarian, which is an important part of also advancement and of unity of purpose here, which gets really brushed aside. So two last comments. Ashley mentioned in her opening, her comment in response to you that she used the word global. I would also put that as we discuss this, I think this very issue does have global ramifications. It is an important one. What happens in the transatlantic arena really does have global ramifications. And how we handle it, how we step forward and deal with it is, is, is key. Mm -hmm. And the second piece, because I'm the American on this, uh, on, this, on this panel of stepping forward, I think also mixed in this is the question of America's role in the world. I'd like to see us engaged. That's the side of the issue that I fit on. But by the way, does that mean to ignore what's happening in our own domestic arena? No. There has to be a balance. Uh, but it can't, in my view, I think the worst scenario is one extreme or the other extreme. You have to balance both because the fact of the matter is what's happening in Europe does have consequences, in my view, for us. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. You, you are actually, uh, you know, uh, you have pointed to all the important aspects that we're going to talk about. And but what you say about the moral narrative is is, is very important. But the the the, um, the question is, uh, how do the elite um, tackle? the internal issue of, of this rebellion. Because, I mean, as you've mentioned, we, we, we are we, we're confronted to many uh, different challenges. We have the Russia challenges, as you said, and in a way, you know, the, the moral issue of uh, are we going to help, you know, Ukraine, uh, which needs help, and are we going to make sure that, you know, international law is, is being respected? So that's one point. We're going to come back to that. But we, how do we... Uh, are, we, are we able to uh, protect and defend the institutions that you believe in and that we all believe in, uh, these, uh, the democracy, the democracy, institution of democracy, and the alliances we have, uh, you know, we've built uh, since uh, 1945. If, we, if uh, the worm is of doubt and, and divide over what we should do is inside our society. So how do we answer internally and, and um, to the challenge if the, if the people actually don't believe that the elites and the, the, and the, uh, the, the people in charge are able to, to face the real threats? Because uh, we, in terms of morals, you know, I, I don't understand exactly what you mean by the morals. When you talk about the migrations and uh, the, the question of immigration, is it, uh, is it a, a truth established that open-ended immigration uh, is, is, is moral, for instance, or do the, 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 the nations have the right to question whether this is the right model? 
uh, this open-ended immigration, because this is what they are doing now. So how do we, how do we square that? And if we don't answer that, don't we, uh, don't we just run the risk that uh, people will just shift then to s a kind of uh, authoritarian uh, model? And I, I would like you to answer uh, about that. And then Benjamin, because Benjamin, actually we talked before and he wanted to, talk, to, to touch upon this very issue. Okay. Let, let, me, let me say that, uh, no, you raise some very important points. Let me define what I was trying to say. And maybe let me refer to a professor of mine that I is now deceased, but Samuel Huntington at Harvard. He wrote a book in which he was looking at the American political system. He says it goes through four cycles. He said the worst cycle is what, what he calls, you know, in this case it was the IVI gap, ideals versus institutions. Mm -hmm. The worst cycle is when your institutions do not live up to your ideals. And the public is disillusioned, they feel betrayed, they feel it's not delivering, that it's not doing what we're identified with. That's what I'm saying. First, there are moral standards of what we're all about in terms of the uh, kinds of freedoms, freedom of opportunity, freedom of speech, freedom of travel, the basic uh, human freedoms that identify us and what we're, we've held so dearly. But the fact of the matter is, in terms of the establishment and our institutions, no, I would say that we have had challenges in the way in which we have been dealing with it. That's why I did suggest there has to be some modification because the world has changed. But to answer precisely your question, I mean, when I look at the United States and when I was in government, by the way, I had the Refugee Bureau. I mean, we've had ebbs and flows in our own history of how many refugees we bring in. Mm -hmm. I think of the heyday of the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, in that context, there were many who came into the United States. We've had ebbs and flows. I think that each country does have to, I'm looking at the individual, not the whole. Each country has to look at what they're capable of, what are the parameters, and leaders have to step forward. But that doesn't mean to the neglect of also having uh, the institutional discussions. You've already Absolutely. heard the comments about sovereignty. Every case is different. Um, uh, so here there is a gap, and that's what I was trying to express. Yes. Uh, let's continue. I mean, if you can sort of... Uh, uh, bounce on, uh, on this issue, uh, Benjamin. I, I completely agree with uh, what Paula Dobriansky said about the, the necessity for leadership and, and the lack thereof, in, especially in Europe these, this, this last decade. Um, you know, I think one of the reasons why the, the National Front and far right has thrived in France, for example, over the last decade is that for a long time it was completely impossible in the political conversation to talk about issues such as law and order, security, or immigration, or identity. And they've, they've had a complete monopoly on these issues that they've hijacked towards a very illiberal, uh, ex, you know, exclusionist uh, narrative, a pro-Russian narrative as well now in, in the case of Europe. So I think the challenge for pro-European liberals is not to be afraid of these issues, but actually reclaim them, reclaim even, even politics. And it's more and more urgent because, you know, with what's been going on in Europe over the last couple of years, you have a convergence at the same time of a financial crisis, of a monetary crisis and obviously Russian aggression on the east, the trouble on the, on the uh, uh, neighborhood and, and, and terrorism and the refugee issue. So you have a convergence of all these issues. You know, you remember 10 years ago, there was a famous book that said that Europe was a post-modern post Kantian paradise. I mean, clearly Hobbes is back with vengeance now in, in Europe. And I think the, uh, the way the European Union functions, it was really, it was built on the idea that you had to overcome politics that you had to create solidarity through technical cooperation, through institutional cooperation. I think what's urgent now for people who want to defend the European model is to show voters that someone's in charge, that there's leadership, and that you can actually, through Europe, not through going back to nativism, but through Europe, you can defend your borders. And I think, you know, the, the, actually the proposition coming from the commission recently on more border patrols and reinforcing Frontex goes in the right direction. You can have a, a serious immigration policy. You can have defense and security, common defense and security, and maybe that, that'll be one of the, the rare good news of Brexit is that the British veto on these issues will, will not be there anymore, hopefully. Um, you, you know, I think that's, that's going to be the, the key challenge. If you look at the Eurosceptic vote, I actually don't like the word Eurosceptic because, you know, 
UK per national front, they're not Euroskeptic, they're anti-European. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you look at this vote, you know, you, you have some people who vote who are genuinely against the European Union, who, who want to go back completely to national borders, to national currencies, et cetera. But you have people who just want leadership on these issues, who have concern, and they don't want elite or political leaders to tell them, you know, borders is something of the past, identity is so passeist, and, and, you know, and, and, and shaming them into abandoning these issues. We have, we have to prove that liberals can, can reclaim that. I think that's, that's going to be the, the big challenge. May I just make two quick, quick Absolutely. points based on, on that? Leadership matters, and I don't think that we are seeing a clear articulation of, mm -hmm. of coming forward of what we're about, what we've always been yes, about, exactly. but also how you bring people in. Mm -hmm. But the second, you mentioned the neighbor to the east, Russia. There's a, a great investment being made in terms of disinformation. Yeah. And that's also a, a play here, which I think needs to be stated. And that goes right to the heart of my point about the moral narrative and the very values. Mm -hmm. President Putin gave a speech, I remember, after the uh, illegal annexation of Crimea on March 18, uh, you know, years back, I guess 2000, 2014. Uh, 2014. And you know, at that time, he said that uh, very specifically that uh, Western values are not our values. Yes, uh, we're being challenged. Mm -hmm. And if we don't step forward and say what we're about, mm -hmm it will affect, uh, if people are disillusioned and they don't know what we're about. And there isn't that kind of leadership okay. and inspiration mm -hmm. and inclusivity. Uh, this, this is a wonderful transition because it brings me back to the third set of questions I wanted to ask, which is main, in, in fact, namely Russia and the Russia factor, which is a huge factor, which has been uh, underestimated, I think, for, for quite a few years. Uh, both here, I think, and uh, in Europe uh, as a threat. Uh, it has shifted with the, there, there was a wake up call, sort of awakening to the Russian threat in uh, 2014 after the uh, first uh, term of President Obama where he really tried to sort of uh, withdraw from, uh, you know, the neighborhood of Russia thinking after the uh, George W. Bush era, which was much more proactive, and then sort of withdraw thinking that it was the, 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 um, actually the mistake of the previous administration which had triggered the aggressiveness of Russia, which I think personally was, is a mistake of analysis and that in fact Russia, uh, it, it is actually inside Russia that the foreign policy of Russia is being cooked and not you know, in reaction to, to, to what is happening outside. So uh, what I want to, to ask uh, Ambassador, uh, who is very well tooled, I think, to um, see uh, the problem is how, how dangerous uh, is uh, the, the capacity of Russia in this time of identity crisis and a shift of a part of the opinion to the far right uh, because they are so obsessed with radical Islam that they want uh, some kind of ally and they think that you know authoritarian Russia is the ally that they should turn mm. to. H how much is it, you know, a sort of a conflation of factors which would be, uh, uh, you know, dangerously uh, uh, worrying for us? Now you put me on to the hell because I'm acting, I'm still the ambassador, but. I'm sorry. I, <laughs> well, I have to say a few things. It's on the record, okay. Let me hang, and then you hang me after. Um, <laughs> I'm of those who were called a few years ago that they are paranoid about Russia. I don't think that those people would call me paranoid today. Yeah. <laughs> My first tough lesson uh, with the approach, because and, and I reply first, how dangerous it is. It's, it's that dangerous how our naivete will continue and how our misperception of the clash of the values will continue. Yeah. We spoke, uh, pa Paula mentioned uh, Huntington, this clash of civilizations, famous article, uh, should be reread today to a certain degree. And we'll come back. My, my first lesson, I have to mention it, because this was a revelation to me at the point. Before we joined uh, NATO, Council uh, encouraged us, new members joining, saying, go to Moscow and explain your reason. Go and tell them that you don't want to join NATO because we want to confront them. Uh, you were you know, in the Soviet uh, time partners, so they may understand you. And I went to Moscow encouraged by this, and I met uh, Sergei Prikhochko at the time, advisor to Putin, we were sitting in the big office, and really, out of my heart, I 
with all of my idealism, uh, which is my life curse, um, I went and I said, you know, with really hard on, on, on my uh, hand, said, explain all the reasons, not because we see Russia as enemy, uh, this is the values we want to reconnect, blah, all, all the things. And he listened to me, he said nothing during that conversation, which lasted about half an hour. And he called Luke. And when I finished, he said, Mr. State Secretary, you don't understand. If you join NATO, we will put you on the list of our enemies. And that was all conversation. Mm. Um, and I was thinking very much, you know, how can you, can you, how can you talk like that? And in the years after, I understood that the country has never gone through any type of modernization. This is not a values uh, which West is linked to. This is something which is a completely different type of society which is not able to compete when the world is open. Uh, and in an open, globalized, competitive world, they can't, you, you would have to accept that you sit at table with countries like Denmark and listen what they say, five million people or Swedes or, or Slovaks, because this is a culture of EU and NATO. Of course, sometimes we do a, a, a bigger male and, and, and a smaller dog, and I don't know what the game, but still you have to sit and listen, and at the end you vote. And if Iceland, without the armed forces, say, you are not going to fuck me up here, you know? They say, no, no vote, and there is no going through. That's it, train stops. Uh, they cannot accept this culture. And for them to bring you back to confrontational mode, it's the survival mode. Uh, so this is a necessity uh, to confront you. And I'm coming back to the information war and how dangerous that is. Yeah. Um, in the last couple of years, and it's becoming stronger and stronger and stronger, we saw a very sophisticated level of uh, propaganda war. Okay, this is nothing new. I recommend another reading, Mr. Pacepa, who was a defected head of Ro Romanian intelligence, wrote an excellent book about the nature of uh, um, um, this uh, desinformatia uh, war, disinformation war. It's an excellent reading. Uh, well, when you look into Slovak in particular, the Czech, Hungarian uh, uh, informational space, you see it's completely overflooded with extremely mm -hmm. efficient information war. Mm -hmm. But it, I'm, the technique, my son found it somewhere, uh, the technique used, it's called the merchandise of doubt. Mm -hmm. So by this technique, you create the cloud. Who said that's the beginning? Uh, I, I think you said this, what, what was it? Uh, the dust, mental dust, yes. this was the word. Um, there's a, a, a something where nobody knows what is right, what is wrong, and you got completely skeptical, you got cynical, and you say, I don't care because it's so complex, it's so complex, nobody has got the truth. There is no truth. Uh, there, there is no truth, but I, you know, I want to go further here because they used this method in the communist days where there was an uh, uh, iron curtain and there was a clear division, and they failed. Because you, you, you know, you can fool some people sometimes, not all people all the time, but now it gets much further because they, add, they smartly use the globalized uh, world, what is globalized world offering. This is the fluidity of capital. A lot of capital went out. President yeah. Putin at some famous meeting some 10 years ago or what, assembled together his top entrepreneurs uh, in oligarchy said, go invest and buy as much as you can. So now uh, it's investment into political lobbying. It comes, you know, people comes in the dark suit speaking perfect English or perfect German. And they'll invest in campaign of CDU party. Uh, they'll invest in another political campaigns. Uh, um, um, they will um, smartly, creatively, financially support all crazy parties in Europe, uh, nationalist, uh, right wing, destructive, but it's not done from Russia Bank. It's coming from a rise, complicated. So it's even hard, if you got the smartest intelligence, it's very hard to trace. So I would close because I'm speak, speaking already for too long. It's very, very dangerous, and we badly underestimate the impact uh, of mm. this. Thank you very much for it's these It's been comments, very destructive. Which are, I think, extremely uh, important in this, uh, what you call it, the merchant, Merchandising doubt. of doubt is, is a, a, you know, a concept that I will use again. I think it's, it's brilliant. Uh, to continue this conversation, sort of link it with what we've said before, uh, Ashley, could you, could you tell us, first of all, if you think that Russia has, in a way, 
used the Brexit to its own interest in Britain. I mean, uh, Russia is extremely present in, in Britain in many ways. I mean, uh, in London, as we know, through very different uh, means and uh, with a strong uh, financial uh, investment. Uh, so how, how much is it playing on, on that kind of movement like the Brexit? And, and if you can then widen the scope and, and tell us how guilty are we about what is happening <laughs> for having closed our eyes on both uh, the challenge that Russia represents and has been representing for many years now, you know, and, and, and at the same time closing our eyes on, for instance, the challenge of radical Islam and actually giving Russia a huge boulevard to work on because they say, okay, for the people who see this radical Islam question, you know, they really don't want to even to talk about it. So, come to me, I'm going to help you. I mean, the link between these two topics is, is absolutely fundamental to understand what is happening now in Europe, don't you think? Um, well, I'll take your first point, which was um, how much Russia is uh, making hay out of Brexit. Now, when um, part of the very um, limited debate, I would say, before the referendum, people were saying, well, the only person who will be pleased about this in Europe is Putin. Um, and that was sort of one of the, the, the few strands of Project Fear that were thrown out. Now, as I said earlier, we haven't even um, formally notified the EU of our intention to leave. Um, it's difficult for me to say how much Russia is actually making out of this right now, but I would say that actually it's not something, if it is going to happen, we probably won't see it for some time. Mm -hmm. um, and then speaking to your second point, um, in 2012, when Mitt Romney said, I believe in a presidential debate, that mm -hmm. Russia remained one of our primary, one of the West's primary uh, adversaries, everyone scoffed mm -hmm. in the UK, I presume in the US too, um, and he's been proven right, which is quite interesting. I do think we've been somewhat guilty of that, personally after Georgia in 2008. Mm -hmm. I think that was a moment that was mm -hmm. missed by the West people, they were too focused on Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and I think actually if you, that was sort of that moment where Putin realized he could get away with certain things so long as the West was sufficiently distracted. The I point about radical extremism, I'm not sure, it's not actually something I've ever really thought about of them being so linked. I mean, obviously Russia has this role in Syria now that has, um, it, it's sort of been using to sort of leverage its own position on the global stage. That's good. I mean, uh, in the sense that, I mean, we've seen Russia extremely clearly actually, uh, you know, stating, look at me, I mean, I, I'm, I'm the Christian nation here. I'm the ones who are, uh, uh, I'm yes. the, the, the yes. country which is, yes. which is uh, fighting radical Islam. True defender of Western uh, Christian values. Exactly. Because in West, exactly. Christianity is all melting. It's exactly. all gay. Exactly. Everybody you look at is gay. Yes, you yes. Know, and this where idea are the that they values? are the new And here know, KGB bearer. colonel is defending Christian values. Yes, yes. well, yes. it's an irony of the... Of, of uh, Benjamin, history, do you want to say a word and then we'll, we'll shift to the last part, which is what should we do? And I think Ambassador Dobrzynski is going to talk more on that. No, I, I completely agree with what you just <laughs> said. I mean, it, it's fascinating to see how Russia now, uh, you know, if I look in France, but I think it's also the case in the United States, it's become a domestic political issue. Yes. It's even beyond foreign policy, right? It's part Absolutely. of an ideological package. So if you're against gay marriage, if you're afraid of Arabs, if you think, you know, if you don't like the European Union, then you're going to be pro-Putin. Yeah. And then yeah. you have people on Facebook and Twitter yeah. who are uh, conveying you know, yeah. RT articles about neo-Nazis in Kiev and all that stuff. They, they don't have a clue what's going on, but they will still you know, uh, 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 <laughs> see <laughs> Vladimir Putin, and he's very apt at portraying himself this way as the, the rampart for the, the Christian West and, and, and moral values, et cetera. Um, now, that being said, um, you know, there clearly is a very strong uh, uh, policy of, of propaganda and, and erosion of the very notion of truth and facts, and you see it on social media, and you see it through RT and all these things. Now, um, that, that does not explain, though, the rise of, of populism. You know, the reason why the National Front it's is thriving, it's, it's not part. because it, it's domestic. It's not because oh, it's supported no, by... No, it's, and, they're no, using it. Ab yes. Absolutely. They're, they're yeah, using it in a very it. opportunistic way. Yes. But I think, you know, it, it is very important to, to look at... Um, what is going on in Europe. If, if you look at the refugee issue, for example, you had this referendum in Hungary 
you know, uh, obviously we can talk about the wording of the, the question, we could talk about the fact that the turnout was only 45%, but 98% of voters yes, exactly. said they were against the refugee quotas Absolutely. imposed the by the European Union. And Absolutely. the campaign was horrible, but if you, if yeah, you were to do a referendum in any country of the European Union, in any country of the 28, you would have a vast majority of people against the, the refugee policy mm -hmm. that's been proposed by Merkel and the, and the so and, and that's not you know clearly Russia is thriving on this and the sort of Russian soft power is thriving on this, but it's not the cause. Exactly. It's a symptom. It's not exactly. the cause. So I think it's very important to differentiate the Absolutely. two. Absolutely, I, I, I think you are totally right here, yes. and and that leads me to to the major I mean question. I mean we are in America, so the Americans are positive people, so when they see a big problem, they say, what do we do to solve it, yeah. right? So. Uh, so that, that's my question, is uh, uh, what do we do to, uh, to, to confront this reality? Um, do, we, uh, do we acknowledge the importance, for instance, of the nation state, again, which has been somehow maybe neglected in solving certain issues? I mean, quite, what do we do with the borders issue, which is, I think, key, uh, Ambassador? and. Uh, what about the Syria issue, which seems to me absolutely existential to the future of Europe? Do, uh, should the Europeans get involved m much more than they have? I mean, I, I guess that apart from the French, really, they have, there hasn't been much willingness to face what is going on in Syria in Europe. And I think it's, it's uh, staggering. You know, it's, it's very surprising given the stakes you know, of what we've seen since September 2015 with this migration which is now you know, shaking everything and, and, and potentially upsetting the whole political uh, system in, in Europe. So how, how do you, how do you and, and what do we see in terms of the battle of ideas, as you said, you know, to sort of preserve both uh, our alliances and, 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 and the notion of truth, you know, uh, our values. So how do you see this, this uh, battle to be well, waged? There, there isn't a, 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 a simple answer and a silver bullet here, mm. but there are a combination of factors. And mm. I, I also think you, know, you also put it, there's the question of the populism and some of the domestic policies. At the same time, there's also the challenges going on that are mm. more broad-based, more strategic, emanating from Moscow uh, because of exploiting the situation. And how do you deal with both? But let's start backwards. You said Syria. I mean, Syria is very complicated in the sense that we've missed, in my view, many opportunities uh, in dealing with the challenge of Syria. Um, I mean, some r major opportuni uh, to opportunities, not that it would have solved uh, the situation, but regrettably, I just don't think that because of where what we have not done in the past and where we are now, there isn't an easy answer to your question. Um, tragically, there were things that could have been done earlier but were not done. Uh, in this case, in my view, by the United States, by countries of the region, and also Europe in this case. Um, but starting with the United States, because we stated that we were going to do certain things and then we didn't. But secondly, you raise the importance of the nation state. Um, I think that uh, 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 the nation state, I've always been a believer in the nation state. Um, uh, regardless of uh, broader institutions. I mean, Europe has had its own experiment, and I think Europe has learned some lessons from its own experiment of those areas that have worked, but those areas that have triggered some negative reactions. And that was my point earlier about, I think it's key to step back and look at what has worked, but what needs to be changed. Absolutely. And again, you have the migration issue so you also have to look at what are the changes that have to be made here. And it, to me, you know, the case of Sweden, I'm picking out Sweden because Sweden takes a very large number of, of, of uh, migrants, uh, by the way, from, from Syria, um, is as different from some of the other countries. Every country is different in terms of how it has to deal with it. But that comes to the institutions. I do think the institutions have a role to play and this is where I was at least emphasizing one piece that has tied us together, but in which I think there's been a complacency. And that is what we're all about, that we're not defending it. And it's a hard time to do it because there has to be change. People are dissatisfied in Europe with the ins broader institutions. But then the question is, looking at our alliances, I mean, on the military component, 
there are factors and considerations that matter greatly today and in which we need to be unified. So it's a very, there isn't a simple answer in my book to your question, but I would say that I think if I had to sort of, sort of step back and sort of summarize it, I think one needs to look at all the factors. The foreign minister gave a speech and I was, as he was speaking, I was writing down. Mm -hmm. There's the political component to this mm -hmm. that really matters greatly. There's the economic component to this, definitely because of the haves, the have nots, and how do you engage? It's not only our trade and transatlantic relationship, but also uh, country by country opportunities. It is about uh, borders. Um, uh, uh, having definition, having definition that makes sense for everyone uh, in this case, rather than just a, a, a you know, kind of a ill-defined type of policy, which exacerbates the, the fears <coughs> and the sentiments of people. And then uh, finally in this mix is, yeah, the, the broader component is, which is the military too in, in the mix, you know, of our alliance. I think we've been complacent and I think the, maybe the, the silver lining here, and I, 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 if I could say that, is that I think that this is going to jar us into action. At least I hope so. I, I just wanted, I really like what you said, and, and I wanted to, to address this question of the military, actually, which is absolutely key. Do you think that, uh, given the fact, I mean, I was struck by that the minister uh, uh, said, uh, actually, if the Americans think that uh, the fact that we, we, we are telling them we, we won't maybe do as much as we used to uh, as we used to do is going to trigger them to do more and get more proactive and he sort of doubted it which I was mm -hmm. struck by and I thought oh if he's right we are in trouble because you know my, my position as a French uh, a citizen and a, and a European is that we'd better start you know thinking in terms of uh, a European much more robust uh, 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 you know, involvement in terms of, of protecting uh, our interest and defending our, our continent because we are faced with these huge issues and we are not warranted, as we, as we see now, that the Americans will be there forever in the way they have been before. So that, that's absolutely well, key. And I think mm -hmm. that in Europe, people are not yet... Uh, uh, so aware of that. Uh, my, my quick answer to that is, in my view, one thing that I don't think is different between our two uh, uh, primary presidential candidates, uh, Clinton and Trump, both have spoken to burden sharing. It sort of ends exactly. there, yeah. but exactly. they've both spoken to Absolutely. burden sharing. So that tells you something yes. in that case. And secondly, I think, right. yes, you have to look at what your role is, but in my view here, there's also a debate about America's role in the world. Absolutely. I identified where I come down on this. I think we should have a leadership role. We should be engaged. But that's balanced by what we also do at home. But there are Americans who do not want to see that activism and want to see us pull back. I think that's clearly manifested in our election, presidential election. I think that Ashley Goldwyn wants to talk. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I can barely see you. Listen. Um, so there are a few points I wanted to make off the back of the entire conversation. Um, the first is the title of this panel is Populist Revolt, and it kind of suggests this has come as a surprise. And my question is, why is it a surprise? Well, the, the answer is probably we've not been listening. And by we, mm -hmm. I mean policymakers, analysts, the people who say they know what they're talking about, we're just not listening. And um, I, I actually, I've been to DC a few times, but it's, yesterday was the first time I went to Ford's Theatre. And um, in the shop, in the gift shop, there was a mug with a, an Abraham Lincoln quote on it. And I know this is not the most authoritative source, but um, the quote was, I am a firm believer in the people. If given the truth, they can be depended upon to meet any national crisis. The great point is to bring them the real facts <laughs> and beer. Now, obviously, the beer point is true. But the facts thing, um, I think one of the, the worst things about the Brexit campaign in the UK, it was utterly devoid of fact this idea that fact is no longer real, experts are no longer sort of to be listened to. Mm. And I think if we're going to build trust, if people are going to lead, if we're going to have that moral leadership, we need to first listen, give facts, and have an honest conversation. And to my mind, institutions internationally, they are not technical for technical cooperation alone. They are political institutions by nature, and if they are not listening, if they believe themselves to be a bar, or somehow beyond politics, I think that is an error. 
And I think that's what you're seeing with the EU. People are responding to something that is beyond the politics of the people that they are there to represent. I, I think this is a magnificent uh, maybe conclusion. I have no idea if we have still time for questions because I don't have a watch. But I just yeah. wanted to say, I mean, what you just said, I think, is absolutely import, <laughs> important. The facts, the battle of ideas. And uh, I think this was Damon uh, earlier who said that we have a window of opportunity because the, I mean, this was quite a dark conversation. But the fact that we have a window of opportunity because people are getting engaged in certain way. Mm -hmm. And so that means it opens up a possibility to uh, expose, convince, and, and, and sort of uh, uh, turn around the tide. Uh, any time for any questions? I don't know if, yes? Do we have two, two minutes, minutes, so maybe we have time for one or two questions, please. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman with the Atlantic Council. Thank you for your commentary. My sense was that you focused a lot on symptoms. And Ashley, there are no facts today. That's one of the realities, unfortunately. <laughs> I would suggest that the fundamental cause for this populism is the nature of governments which are failed or failing. And that applies literally around the world. In your country, Ashley, because I have substantial British business interests, I was asked by the Remain side to be helpful, and I was not. I think that number 10 was either ignorant or arrogant, and had they run a smart campaign, and I think if you took the vote today, it would be 60-40 to Remain. On our side, and I think, Paula, you touched on this with institutions, my guess is if you polled Americans to ask who's a bigger threat, Putin or Congress, it would be a wash. <laughs> and I would say, I'm quite serious about that. I don't, I don't and <laughs> it seems to me that unless we start focusing on demanding more from our governments, yeah. we're not going to get ahead of the game. For example, in NATO, I think that the Wales Summit and the Warsaw Summit really provided the absolute minimum. When you take a look at the readiness action plan and deploying a couple of people to the Baltics, I mean, quite frankly, in a military sense, uh, this is deplorable that five countries in NATO are spending 2%, uh, that's not going to change. And if you go back to the 60s, you may remember a dear great senator named Mike Mansfield, who was threatening to pull American troops out of Europe unless the Europeans paid more. My view, and I'd like you to respond, unless we attack the fundamental cause, which is failed and failing governments, and try to improve them, um, I don't think our lot is going to be better. Now, I balance that by thinking in the future, the Islamic State may end up like the hula hoop, and falling of its own weight. And quite frankly, I think that Mr. Putin is on borrowed time. It's not going to be tomorrow or the next day, but I think there are huge flaws in Russia, and two or three years from now, I don't think you're going to see Mr. Putin in power. But I'd like you to respond to the issue, can we do something to try to repair our institutions from NATO to government as a first step? I have a fast answer for you. My answer already is yes, because I, I felt I said that when I mentioned Huntington. That's what he said. when. Your government doesn't deliver. It is connected with ideals because you expect your government to do certain things for you. So yes, the answer is yes, and that has to be a definitive component of this. Absolutely, absolutely. Would, I'm afraid, I mean, one more word and it will be the, the, the uh, conclusion of the uh, panel. Yeah, I just wanted to add something on, on the issue of facts. I don't want to be the one pushing back against the necessity for facts and truth, obviously. But I think also, I mean, when we're talking about leadership, it's also about what kind of society you want to live in. It's about what kind of hierarchy of values you have. And it's not only facts. If you look at the issue of immigration, you know, you talk to people in Brussels, they'll tell you we need more immigration because we have a demographic deficit, because we have a deficit in the workforce. So, but then you talk to people, they, you know, they will maybe put the, the question of so cultural and social cohesion above uh, uh, compensating the demographic gap with, with immigration. So I, I think it's also, you know, it's also a question of political leadership, like how do you defend yeah. certain values and ideas? And I think our, our leadership, especially in Europe right now, maybe except Merkel, but uh, is, is really, you know, de devoid of these, uh, of that, that moral and ideological backbone. Yeah, and quickly no. to, and add, to, sorry, just quickly yeah. add to that. So yeah, failed and failing governments, perhaps it's because they don't feel they have the mandate or the support to do what they need to do. And they need to get out beyond that and actually lead the conversation and actually have a conversation and stop just re responding to, you know, the latest opinion poll. Thank you very much. This has been, I think, a pretty interesting conversation. Thank you for you for listening and, and for being such good speakers.